Good evening and welcome to St. Timothy's Episcopal Church in Maslin, Ohio, online. This evening, uh, for those on our mailing list, we mailed a bulletin, sometimes two, to your home. If you're not on the mailing list and you would like to fully participate, you can go to our website, which is stimsmaslin.com. Uh, and if you click on the very front page, um, you will, if you scroll down, you will see you can download the bulletin for this service on the front page of our website. Uh, we have much special music this evening, which is great and exciting. Uh, and thanks to the wonders of architecture and technology, everybody will be kept safe this evening. My family is with me here in the chapel, and they will be helping with the readings and the prayers and the singing with gusto. So, we begin our service this evening with our opening hymn, Joy to the World. the true light 
grant that we, who have known the mystery of that light on earth, may also enjoy him perfectly in heaven, where with you and the Holy Spirit he lives and reigns, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. We continue with the readings. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. The people who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God.
Paul's letter to Titus. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to renounce impiety and worldly passions, and in the present age, to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He it is who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify for himself a people of his own who are zealous for good deeds. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and earth and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard, as it had been told to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated, my family. <laughs> Except for one of you. Because, starting three years ago, at the early family service here at St. Timothy's, we started a tradition that the youngest child in the room would place Jesus into the manger setting. Tonight, that youngest child is our daughter, Lily. So Lily is going to have the high, extreme honor of placing Jesus into the manger. Thank you, Lily Bow. <laughs> then normally, I would have all the children come up front and I would tell them something about hope and about gifts and about Jesus. And then all of their parents out in the room would laugh at how funny they were and I would look like a better priest. <laughs> anyway, once you have a tradition, around the church you can't not do it so that's what we did speaking of traditions christmas traditions christmas traditions are a big part of the holiday for everyone there are lots of traditions that lots of people do like putting christmas trees in our homes and lights on our gutters and there are lots of traditions that only some people do like going to church or watching the hallmark channel and then there are a few traditions that only a few people do, like the family I know in Michigan who hides a pickle in their tree every year. You do you. There is no counting for traditions and no limit to how much they can expand either. As we say in church circles, if you do something two years in a row, it's a tradition. See what I'm saying? As it turns out, many of our most common traditions have little to do with the birth of Jesus. Way back in the year 320 AD, after converting to Christianity, Constantine tried to unite the Roman Empire into common practices based on the Christian calendar. Rather than try to stamp out pagan holidays, he decreed that Christmas would be moved to a time near the winter solstice. In this way, all the citizens of the massive Roman Empire would celebrate at the same time. And so, the birth of Jesus coincides with the resurrection of Osiris, the birth of the son of Isis, the feast days for Apollo and Dionysus, and the Roman festival of Saturnalia, plus a whole lot more. And then, we get all their traditions brought along into our typical Christmas celebrations. We get feasting, gift giving, and goodwill from the Romans, mistletoe from the Druids, holly from pagan practices, ivy from Bacchus, and all things Yule from the Norse. And the word wassail means be whole and comes to us from Anglo-Saxon pagans 
who threw spiced cider on apple trees to appease the gods of fruit and said, Behold! This practice then led to a procession around the neighborhood going door to door singing songs, which sounds a lot like caroling. But chiefly, all through the Middle Ages, the main thing was the parties and the feasting. The 12 days of Christmas brought the entire known world together for feasting and drinking and carousing. Shops were closed and people just plain celebrated for a couple of weeks every year. Constantine had decided that if people were going to party, they should party for Jesus. But along come the Puritan reformers who said, no, 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 no. People should never party for any reason. So starting in the 1600s, shops were forced to be open on Christmas and churches were forced to be closed. No singing, no dancing, no feasting or gift giving. Advent became Lent version 2.0. This solemn, drab holiday season continues for a couple of centuries until Charles Dickens invents Christmas, <laughs> or reinvents Christmas. Obviously, it wasn't just Charles Dickens, but he's the name we know. And so, in the 1800s, Christmas comes roaring back with all the pagan accoutrements of the Middle Ages. We get the holly and the ivy, the big feasts, the gift giving, the bonfires, the spiced cider, the mistletoe, the singing from door to door, and because it's the 1800s, the top hats, the horse-drawn sleigh, and someone had to invent Christmas cards because they didn't have the internet. When you think of your idealized Christmas, you're probably picturing a scene out of Dickens, right? This is why because celebrating Christmas came back in the 1800s. So, I give you all of that setup just to bring us back to where we started, Christmas traditions. As you see, most of them have little connection to the birth of Jesus, and that's okay. Christmas traditions are still important, however we got them whether we know where they came from or not, whether we embrace them or run away from them. And if we don't have our own traditions, then by golly, we will appropriate some traditions from the Celts, Druids, and Vikings. We need traditions. We need them because of what they do for us. Traditions give us the security and predictability of repetition. And the liturgy works like this too. The liturgy gives us structure. Even the so-called non-liturgical churches have a liturgy. The song goes here, the sermon goes there, the offering goes here. We don't want things changing all the time. And over the long haul, life works like this too. The whole point of a Christmas tradition is to do what we did last year. Or do it the way we've always done it or do it the way my family did it when I was growing up. Which is why marriage counselors say that if a couple can get through their first Christmas together, they can get through almost anything. And the loss of so many Christmas traditions is why Christmas is so hard for us this year. Most of the things we think of as traditional are not happening this year. Here at St. Timothy's, we didn't decorate the church like we usually do. We didn't host the candlelight walk. Our small but mighty choir will not be belting out descants that make the rector cry. And in our personal lives, this is the time of year when we normally visit with family and try to figure out how to sort out all those holiday party invitations. This is a hard Christmas for everyone. Shop owners are barely hanging on. Families are reduced to watching siblings open presents on Zoom. Some grandparents are spending their first Christmas alone. 
And for a lot of people, there will be an empty seat at the table for the first time in decades. Tomorrow morning is not going to be easy for any of us, but especially for those who mourn. Traditions and expectations have been busted up and shattered everywhere we look. Christmas is so much about the traditions, and many of those traditions have been taken away from us. Without these traditions, is it really even Christmas? It takes some effort, doesn't it? Because when it comes down to it, Christmas is more than just Jesus. That's the truth of it. But let's set aside the specific traditions for a moment, since we can't have all those this year. And let's ask ourselves this question. Why do we want Christmas in the first place? Like, what is it about this particular church holiday that makes it so important to have traditions and rituals to market? It's obviously second nature to us, since it all came rushing back once Dickens opened the gate. Clearly, we have a deep-seated desire to feast and give gifts and be with family and sing carols. But why at this time of year? Well, at least here in the Northern Hemisphere, this is the darkest time of the year. It's cold and dark and lonely. And if you think about it, all our Christmas traditions are aimed at countering all of that. All the flowers have died, so we bring huge trees into our homes. It's cold outside, so we light fires and drink warm beverages. It's dark out, so we put Christmas lights on anything that doesn't move, and on some things that do move. <laughs> it's lonely, so we gather with friends and family to remind ourselves that we are not alone. God knows that we need feasting with family and friends. God knows that we need to gather and sing carols together. God knows we need the twinkling lights and the beautiful decorations. God knows those descants make the rector cry. And God knows we are missing all those things. And God gives us Jesus as the light of the world, as the hope of salvation. The traditions we are missing are important, but they're important because they're connected to Jesus, even if they didn't start out that way. The traditions give us hope, something to look forward to each year. But all of those things point to this baby Jesus, whose birth we celebrate tonight. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, as we heard the angels say, do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. When John the Baptist sent his followers to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answers, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have good news brought to them. In a word, it all points to hope. Hope. All of those traditions and rituals and yearly reminders point to hope. Those traditions are good because they remind us of Jesus. In normal times, each and every one of those traditions brings us hope. Even that wacky thing about hiding a pickle ornament in the tree 
Everybody hopes to be the one to find it. We do all this decorating and socializing and present giving because of hope, which points us to the greatest hope of all, found in that stable behind the inn in Bethlehem. In this most unusual year, we are missing a lot of our traditions, which reminds us of the hope we have in Jesus. But no matter what you have had to give up or put off this year, no matter what has been taken away from you this year, I pray that God moves your attention toward hope. Because sometimes hope is all we have. The hope that a newborn baby will change the world. The greatest hope of all. The good news of great joy for all the people. The sure hope that God has not given up on the world that God has not given up on you, that God has not given up on Christmas. May God continue to point you toward that hope. Merry Christmas, and God bless us, everyone. Amen. We profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we enjoy an anthem sung by Ellen Elder Joseph.
We continue with the prayers of the people. The prayers of the people, Form 3. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all, all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let thy perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and for those of others. We offer prayers for David, Anne, Bob, Chris, Judy, Priya, Chuck, Michael, Bob, Chester, Stormy, Dave, Jeff, Eve, Sherry, Margaret, Aaron, Charlene, Dan, Sarah, Brian, Corin, and Stephanie, Pete, Charles, Alan, and all those affected by COVID-19. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. My family may share the peace with you. Uh, by way of a couple of announcements, um, coming up, we'll have uh, Holy Eucharist. We're using Prayer D. If you don't have a bulletin, it's Prayer D. It's, uh, I don't have the page number in front of me, so it's in the Book of Common Prayer. But after communion, 
Uh, since we cannot be in the space and distribute communion to you, we'll have a prayer for spiritual communion, which you'll find in the bulletin, followed by the post-communion prayer. After the post-communion prayer, we normally, here at St. Timothy's, as is our tradition, turn off the lights and hold candles and sing Silent Night. We will dim the lights when that time comes for this uh, meditation carol. We encourage you at home to go ahead and light candles, turn off the lights if you want, um, sing along with us, and, um, and then the service will end after that. So I tell you all of that just to let you know. Uh, again, special thanks to Levy, our organist, Andrew, our choir master, and Ellen Elder Joseph for her lovely voice and guitar playing. Um, they will be doing some more music coming up, so that we have that to look forward to. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God.
thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible, from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day. And beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, 
awaiting his coming in glory and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We Thank you. 
Let us pray together the prayer for spiritual communion. We offer our praise and thanksgiving, O Lord, in union with your faithful people at every altar where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we ask you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Let's pray together the post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ's hard work. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, the honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the meditation carol.
May Christ, who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and things heavenly, fill you with his joy and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.
Merry Christmas, y'all.